Hello and welcome to Exo Photography. My name is Daniel. Um, I have been photographing uh, three objects uh, during this uh, autumn winter, <clears throat> and now it's time to actually edit the first image. Uh, I collect huge amount of data, so um, I ending up quite late in the season before editing the first object. The first object is um, the elephant trunk nebula. I bought my ZWO ASI 2600 mm camera this summer and uh, I actually edited this uh, this image almost one month ago but uh, in January first um, because I was shooting images for that object almost to New Year's Eve so I will take you through the steps um, I usually take, I am a novice at pics inside, I am not the best of editing photos, but this is per now my, my workflow. First of all, um, before I even uh, uh, start doing anything, I take all the images, put them in the same folder, and uh, I choose the subframe selector. And uh, this is a great tool to evaluate the quality of your images. And uh, I am, first of all, you load all images in here. First the H alpha, then the O3, and then the S2. I take my time during this. Uh, I probably spend about one or two hours doing this, uh, fiddling about uh, making the right settings, um, sub from scale, um, camera gain, resolution, all of these. I don't fiddle about with these parameters here. Um, then you analyze the images takes a while uh, it's computer intensive and then you get a plot here I am looking at three variables the signal to noise ratio you want a lot of signal and not so much noise the more images you stack the better the signal to noise ratio you get but each individual image is containing some amount of signal some amount of noise you want the ratio to be uh, as big as possible. The second um, criteria I look at is the full width half maximum. Basically that is a measurement of how well focused the star is or uh, how good the seeing is, how transparent the, the sky is. Um, the smaller number the better. The third one is eccentricity. That is how round the star is. Basically you want a value below 0 0.6 and uh, below that the human eye has <coughs> trouble identifying a round object being not round um, or an oval shape being, being oval basically. So the lower the number the better. These three figures I can fill about with um, making them um, correlate to each other. Um, there are tons of videos out there so I won't go through that in detail. What I do is I set in the criteria. Below this value is okay, above is not, and so on for each criteria. And then I output the images which is approved. And uh, after I've done that I uh, for this particular image, I, uh, I gather just above 30 hours of exposure time for the three filters H-alpha, sulfur and oxygen. And uh, I ended up keeping 13 hours of those. So more than half of the images I just threw away. They had either bad signal to noise ratio or there weren't such a good sky, so the full width half maximum value was uh, over the roof, uh, or the eccentricity value was too high. When I'm done with that, I usually 
take a look at the blink and this is this is very easy you just load in all your images and uh, you make like a sequence you can choose how long each image is going to display and it basically plays them all so you can see if something is very off for those 13 hours of, of data maybe I threw away I don't know maybe half an hour during the blink process um, some images was uh, quite quite a bit off in framing don't know why um, but hey uh, I got rid of those uh, I stacked the images so I used the um, the batch pre-processing, the new weighted batch pre-processing 2.0 uh, you load in your calibration frames and, and your light frames and set set all these settings once again I won't go, go through this but I do all the settings uh, and, and just run it after that I end up with three images um, H-alpha, O3 and Salfa so I do a dynamic crop, um, some images get just a little bit rotated is, uh, how the, the framing is done in the sequence program. So I crop the images just a bit and I then do either an automatic background extractor or a dynamic background extraction. That is to even out uh, uneven illuminated background um, this time I end up with the automatic and uh, sometime I don't run them at all. Okay, when we have done that we need to identify which channel is the strongest in signal. Um, because when we um, blend those images together to create a color image we want um, all images to be leveled out so I use linear fit. And the reference image you are going to use, you can see here, my H-alpha image is already set. That is because H-alpha is probably all, almost all the time is going to be the strongest in signal. And then the uh, O3 and Sulfur will bump up, so they correspond to the H-alpha. Okay, so we done the dynamic crop, we done the linear fit and the background extraction. To bring out some more details, we want to do deconvolution. And that is a quite time-consuming process. There are scripts out there that works okay, um, but I learned this from scratch before the script <laughs> even existed. So I just keep doing this. Um, so deconvolution is tightening down the stars just a little bit, increasing the details just a little bit. This is when you're using this technique, you really need to be subtle. What we are doing, let's see if I have a yeah, I have a PSF. So I'm going to zoom this in. We're going to create a, a synthetic star representation of the medium star in the image. You're doing that with uh, dynamic PSF of course. You click on each star in the image. A lot of stars. Uh, we're going to deal with that later. So we have a list here of all the stars. You want to choose the same type of stars, preferably more fat. I choose 150 stars and I sort them out with the best quality, the best ratio, and uh, uh, same type of, of algorithm used. Uh, I always end up with more fat, and then I usually end up with 30 stars, perfect stars. And then these 30 star is um, averaged out, and uh, this is what came out, a representation of all the stars. Okay, that's the first of three things you need to do in the convolution. <clears throat> then you want to make a star mask of the image. This is because we want to protect the center of the stars. Uh, when you use the convolution, they can be like black spots in the middle of the stars. We don't want that, so we need a star mask. 
we also need a you can you can also do a, a range mask to protect some of the details you don't want to to change and what don't we want to change what kind of details do we not want to uh, emphasize or highlight noise because we need to blacken out or, or mask the noise and you can do that with a range mask now we have those three tools then we can go along and open the convolution we load in our PSF and uh, you can start off with 10 or 20 iterations I end up using 30 or 40 we need to check the ringing because here is when the star mask is uh, going to be applied uh, you also need to change the global dark and uh, possibly global bright but uh, just try at the default values first um, you can adjust these uh, thresholds down here as well this is approximately four and a half hours worth of data it is uh, as you can see here it's automatic background extracted linear fit and uh, deconvolution so this is the data I have to work with Oops, and I really start to enjoy how the image looks like. And be aware, we haven't stretched these images yet. They are in the linear state. This is important because in the linear state, uh, it tend to handle the uh, the uh, uh, computation of the images better. I believe on these images, the O uh, three and uh, sulfur I used uh, the Muir noise reduction this is super simple to use but there's a trick you see these detector uh, numbers here you need to figure out the detector settings so to figure out what settings to use you load in two uncalibrated flat frames and to um, bias or dark frames and this setting um, dialog will calculate the gain uh, of your camera and the Gaussian noise and the offset that's it you load those um, figures into uh, this window here don't choose any flat field here um, combination count is what you might be fiddling with start off with 50 or 60 something I bumped it up to 280 and this is doing a superb job this is what I used on the uh, O3 and the S2 image now it's time to combine them and that is probably the easiest um, thing I do the LRGB combination tool basically no that we did a linear fit first so if you do this by the book you can tweak these just a little bit but you probably won't need them you can bump up the saturation but we can fix that later we've done the lrgb combination what we want to do then is the uh, histogram transformation because we are still in the linear state and now we want to make it a, a permanent stretch so we do it with a histogram transformation we do an automatic stretch with the string stretch function then you just basically move the settings inside the history and transformation and then you apply it to the image and it works quite well now we want to do a, a CNR because when you are shooting narrow band images you will probably get magenta stars here's the unstretched image and boom now we stretch it <clears throat> the stars looks magenta we don't want that so how do we do this? Well, we invert the image and now you can see because the SCNR tool removes, it's, it does a great job of removing green tint. So magenta isn't green, but we have a lot of greens in our image we want to keep right. Invert the image, boom, <laughs> we got green stars, apply the SCNR boom you can see that did you see the change 
boom, and then re-invert the image. No more magenta stars. And you can actually see the stars is starting to look quite natural. Um, bit of orange stars, uh, white, bluish. So this really, really works. We want also to bump up the uh, the colors, right? You want the image to pop just a little bit more. So we do a color saturation. I, I usually do, since we've done a linear fit, I usually do a a quite flat curve. I, I raise the amount of saturation all across all colors. Might want to keep the red channel down just a little bit because we have some noise which is more prominent in the red channel. So here we go, boom. So this is my final image before I saw online that they have released. Uh, I, I don't remember his name, but kudos to whoever made Starnet version two. I used Starnet one with not so great results. So I just, no, I ain't gonna use it. It's, it's not worth it. Um, but then I used Starnet two, boom. Take a look at this. I really enjoy this image, a starless version. This is my first real starless version I have done with okay results. This is my elephant trunk nebula. So this is the first object I have edited. Um, coming up is the bubble nebula. Um, I believe I have 35 or 40 hours of exposure on that one. Um, I still keep collecting data for the monkey head nebula. Uh, it's still um, quite good in the sky, so I will keep collecting that as long as the season permits. And then I have started to collecting a shitload of images of the M3, the globular cluster. And that's a first for me. I've never uh, taken a picture of a globular cluster before. That is in uh, LRGB not narrow band. So if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and hitting the like button. It really means a lot to me. And uh, I see you out there and uh, hopefully some more images.